Hi everyone, let us discuss global economic forces and national differences in economic development. Once again, it's me, Tulu. So we need to ask ourselves a very important question. What is the external environment in business? The external environment in business is composed of all outside forces or influences that impact the operations of the business. So everything outside of the business that can impact the business. So what are these things outside the business that can impact the business? Well, we have a multi-layered environment or a multi-layered environment. First of all, you have the local community. So impacts of the local region on production. For instance, you have um, local laws, local legislation, right? Local customs, local practices that can impact the business. And then you have national environmental issues. So things that happen on a national or a countrywide basis, the impacts of national laws, of regulation, of political environment and national culture. Of course, the things happening at the local level or regional level will be impacted by things happening at the national level, although sometimes you might have some sort of um, isolation depending on what you are in the country. And of course, things that are happening nationally will be impacted by things that are happening in your part of the world. So regionally, right? So these are impacts of neighboring countries, economic ties, political ties that you have, right? If your country is signing, say, regional trade agreements, right? The national environment will be impacted by that. And then you have global issues or whole world issues, right? So you have global issues that can then impact regional issues that can then impact national issues and then can impact on the local community. Or, you know, you can be uh, a country that maybe has some trade ties with uh, the region that you're in, but you're more uh, global looking. For instance, how the UK is trying to be after Brexit. OK, so these are the things that will affect the business environment, the external business environment, this multi layered environment that we're talking about. Now, let us examine these layers of the business environment, and we can do this by looking at the macro environment. OK, so the national environment. We can look at the industry or sector that we find ourselves in, and we could look at uh, the competition or the markets that we're in. And finally, we can look at the organization itself. And here we can look at both things within the organization, but of course, uh, looking more in-depthly for this particular lecture on the things outside the environment, okay, the business environment. All right, so we can look at the national level looking uh, through the lens of the PESTEL analysis, P-E-S-T-E-L. Some textbooks will have P-E-S-T-L-E. -E. It's the same thing. So P stands for political, E stands for economic, S stands for social, T stands for technological, E stands for ecological or environmental, L stands for legal. Okay, so you can analyze the macro environment through this lens and we will do so now. You can look at the industry perspective through Porter's Five Forces. Uh, there are different ways to analyze competitors, different markets um, or marketing uh, tools for that. And of course, you can use the SWOT analysis to look at the organization. Now we'll look at the PESTO analysis, then we'll go Porter's Five Forces, and then we will look at the SWOT analysis. So let's analyze the business environment using the PESTO framework. Here you're looking at the impact of potential changes to the operating environment 
of a company. Political changes. So what will happen if there are changes in government policy to your company? For instance, the government might be looking to invest in the sector you're in. They might be bringing new laws that might restrict operations. Right. So how does that impact the company? Uh, economic issues will definitely impact the company. So economic growth, for instance, are you in a period of boom or of decline? Right. So, if, of course, if you're in a period of boom, people will be spending more. There'll be more investments. There'll be more money to spend. You'll be able to bring out new products and services to the market. Um, the exchange rate. So if your exchange rate is such that it makes your goods cheaper to sell abroad, that might be a good thing. Uh, or it, your exchange rate could make it difficult for you to buy from abroad if you consume goods from abroad. The interest rate could make it harder to borrow if the interest rates go too high, make it more attractive to save than to borrow or make it uh, not feasible to borrow the taxation levels. So if taxes are so high that you cannot reinvest or that people don't have enough money to spend, okay, and growth rates around the world. So you might be thinking of expand into a country where the growth rate is high, where national income is rising. And we'll talk about national income soon. And then that will make it attractive for you. Maybe the middle class is rising. People have more money to spend. And that uh, is an economic condition that could affect your business, your macro environment. Social issues could also affect the business. Changing trends, changing culture, changing demographics. So if you sell goods and services to a certain demographic, let's say you sell uh, goods to young people, for instance, let's look at the case of Nike sells sportswear predominantly to young people. Right. So when you have more young people, so uh, birth rates from, say, two decades or a decade and a half ago is now impacting your business environment. Uh, you know, changing taste, if people are becoming more vegan or prefer more vegetarian diets or people are changing their culture, right, for social issues, for social justice, they're now looking to you to be more ethical, that will affect your business environment. Think of the Black Lives Matter movement, for instance. Technological issues, things like the internet, nanotechnology, AI, robotics, right, machine learning, OK, so if there are technologies that are now being used, you have to know about them and incorporate them if they will make you more efficient. So if, say, two decades ago you wanted to send a letter, you would have had to have a typewriter and a good typist. Now you need to have a good computer and someone that can write emails. Right. OK, so if you're still using typewriters, you will be slower. And of course, your uh, post will um be more expensive because you have to buy stamp and, and of course uh, send via the post office okay so there are technological issues you have to be aware of as well and then ecological issues or environmental issues green issues okay climate change is real and if you're doing things if you're in an industry that is impacting climate change negatively so making climate change worse of course there are issues uh with that industry and of course you know government regulation might step in uh, legal issues so changes in the law in tax regimes in copyright issues in health and safety right so think about changes in the working age you know in in the retirement age all of that will have an impact on your workforce Okay. Now, it's important to know that some of these issues might, even though we're looking at it from a national level, might actually be regional or global. Right. It's possible. For instance, you could have uh, COP26 or different or COP28 or different uh, agreements for environmental issues that will affect your business if they are taken seriously by your home government, of course. OK. Changes in technology uh, global might affect your business as well economic changes for instance a global recession or a global boom might affect your business of course uh political issues as well so it's important to note that
The next way we will look at the business environment is by looking at Porter's five forces. So how do we use Porter's five forces? Well, Porter's five forces is a framework used by uh, Michael Porter, introduced by Michael Porter. And here you're trying to look at how attractive an industry is to you. And there are five uh, forces here. You have the threat of new entry. So the threat of other competition coming into your industry and trying to take away your lunch, trying to take away your business, trying to take away your customers. You have the buyer power. So how reliant are you on your customers? Okay, so uh, how much power do your customers have over you? You have the threat of substitution. So are there alternatives to your product or service? Can your customers go somewhere else? You have supplier power, which looks at the power of those that supply you raw materials and components that you have in your products and services. And of course, finally, you have competitive rivalry. So what are your current competitors and what are the risks? Who are those that compete against you? These are the five forces. Let's go over these in detail. Now, it's important to note that for the five forces, we usually analyze this in terms of threats being high. So lots of threats, medium, so a middle level of threat and low. You want these threats to be low. You want low threats. So let's look at the threat of new entry. How easy is it to enter the market? You can look at things like the time and cost of entry. Some industries will take you a longer period of time to go in and of course a higher cost of entry. You might have to pay license fees, legal fees. The process to get a license might take a long time from the government. Of course, if this is the case, then it will lower the threat of entry. So other business men and other business women, other organizations will find it difficult to come into this industry into your market specialist knowledge so there are some markets some businesses some goods that require specialist knowledge to operate there uh, for instance if you're a brain surgeon right other people who cannot perform brain surgery should not be performing brain surgery and of course the threat of new entrants will be lower but there are some businesses where there is a high threat of new entry think about opening a corner shop and you see this in many developing countries somebody starts a corner shop there another one opens just right beside it the other one's by the corner there the one is by the road there okay so uh wait because there is no uh, specialist knowledge needed because the time and cost of entry is low. Anybody can get in there. The next is economies of scale. Some markets, uh, there are players that are so large that their cost per unit are low. Think about Tesco in the UK. Okay. Uh, it will be hard for a corner shop to compete against Tesco because of the large economies of scale, because the cost of unit of production is low. So when larger firms want to buy goods and services, they get a discount. So the cost per unit is low, the transportation cost is low, and this feeds into cost advantages. The next uh, way to analyze threat of new entry. They have cost advantages. It could be cheaper for them to attract labor, for instance. The next uh, way to analyze the threat of new entrants are your technology protection. It could be that their intellectual property rights, their IP, um, issues, their patents that protect orders from coming into this market. Of course, this will make the threat of new entrants lower. And there could be other government barriers to entry, a physical barrier to entry. It could be um, that you have to get oil if you're an oil company from a physical location. And if other firms cannot get to that physical location, they have a barrier to entry. So this is how to analyze the threat of new entry. And like I said, uh, you want to keep that threat low.
Next, we have supplier power. Once again, we don't want to have our suppliers to have too much power over us. So we want to keep supplier power low. Uh, how do we analyze this? Now, remember, we are asking, do our suppliers, the people we buy from, do they have power over us? Well, we want to look at the number of suppliers. We want to have a large number of suppliers. If we have just one or two suppliers, if that one supplier goes bust or if they increase their price, we're in trouble. So you want to have a large number of suppliers. In terms of the size of suppliers, you don't want them to be too big. You don't want to have a monopoly supplying you because if they are too big, right, then once again you have a problem because they are the dominant players in the market uniqueness of service you don't want suppliers to be supplying you something that is so unique that you can only get from them you want to get products from them that you can get from a variety of suppliers your ability to substitute you want to be able to change suppliers if you cannot substitute suppliers you will or you might have trouble down the line cost of changing so how costly is it for you or your business to change suppliers, right? So you want your cost of changing suppliers to be low as well. You want to keep it as low as possible. And this is how you um, analyze your supplier power. Once again, you want to keep your supplier power low. Next, we have to ask, is there an alternative to our product or service? Ladies and gentlemen, you don't want there to be an alternative to your product or service. You want to keep this threat low as well. So you're looking at things like substitute performance. Is there a commodity that people can use that substitutes for our good or our service? Right. Um, if we are making beverages, you know, uh, can they buy from our competitors or instead of buying beverage, can they buy water or something else or, or coffee? Right. Um, so is there a substitute good that performs the, the function that our good performs? The cost of change. OK, um, you want to keep the cost of change, you know, maybe high or you don't want people to be able to change just like that. So maybe you want to tie them into a contract. You want to keep the cost of change uh, not zero, basically, so that they they, 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 they they have to stay with you. Now, I'm not saying this is ethical, you know, but um, it is it is. Uh, a way to neutralize the threat of substitution it could be that if they need to change from you they have to pay some fees you know maybe it's, it's in a different geographical location or maybe it's just very difficult to do so the next framework here is buyer power how reliant are we on our customers you don't want to be too reliant on your customers i know your business you want to have customers but you want to have a large number of customers like we have there, number one number of customers. You don't want to have just one or two customers because if they do not buy from you for any reason, you're in, you know, you're in, in, in some trouble there, right? You're in some hot water. So you want to have a large number of customers. You don't want to have some customers that have to have big sizes of orders because if that happens, if they do not order once again, you know, it, things could be tricky. Um, you know the difference between competitors so here you're looking at things like um when you supply these customers you want to have some different to your products okay um you know there's something unique to your product um price sensitivity you don't want customers to be too sensitive to prices because if you change prices say for instance there you had a change in cost or there was some inflation you've had to increase wages um and as a result of this, you've had to increase prices. If customers are too sensitive to price, then they will leave. Okay, so you don't want to have goods or services or customers that are too sensitive to price. The ability to substitute. You don't want customers to be able to substitute your goods and services for another one, almost like we saw with, with, with supplier power. This is the opposite here. And the cost of changing. You don't want customers to be able to change, um, uh, you know, um, from your goods or service almost like we saw in the previous uh, factor but yes you you do want to have some hold over your customers competitive rivalry here you're looking at this final factor what who are our current competitors and what are the risks you're looking at things like what is the number of competitors 
So how many competitors do we have? Can we put that down? Of course, you don't want to have too many competitors. Quality differences. What's the difference in quality of goods and services between the competition, among the competitors? Are there other differences? Can you produce and supply goods and services that have some sort of difference? Maybe taste difference, maybe packaging, you know, maybe the way you, you produce and you give out these goods and services. There's some difference that sets you apart. Switching costs, okay? Um, what is the cost of switching between one competitor to another? Okay, the government will definitely want to keep this low, but what is the cost in the market? And then customer loyalty. How loyal are customers to the competition? And how loyal are your customers to you as well? Okay, and this is how you measure uh, the uh, degree of competitive rivalry. Once again, you want to be in a place where competitive rivalry is low. But of course, customers would like to be in a place where competitive rivalry is high, so the prices can come lower. You can supply them with a variety of goods and services. Your customers will also like to have lots of buyer power over you, as will your suppliers, okay? So you have to analyze all these forces. Okay, so we've looked at the PESTO analysis, we've looked at Porter's five forces, now we will look at SWOT analysis. With the SWOT analysis, we're looking at some parts of the internal environment and also some parts of the external environment, uh, which is our basis of this whole discussion. So when you look at the internal environment, you're looking at two of the uh, letters that we have there. So SWOT is uh, strengths, that's S, weaknesses, W, opportunities, O, threats, T, SWOT, S, W, O, T, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Strengths, you're looking at the things that you do well um, within your organization. What are the things you're good at? right? Um, and these are the things that will set you apart from the competition, right? So maybe you've done your Ports of Five Forces. These are things that will set you apart because you're good at this thing or these things. These are your strengths. Weaknesses are areas you need to improve on, things you're not so good at. And you can see strengths and weaknesses are internal to the organization. Then you have your opportunities. Your opportunities are things outside the opportunity. The, the, the organization, things you can take advantage of. Maybe demographics are changing, maybe tastes are changing, maybe government policy is changing, maybe regional issues are changing, and you can take advantage of, of these to advance uh, your organization's um, um, outlook. And then you have threats. So threats are uh, things outside the organization that could be potential problems or risks in the future, things you might face later, potential troubles that you might face. These are threats, okay? And as you can see, strengths and weaknesses are internal, um, opportunities and threats are external. And if you look on uh, my left, could be your right, depending on how you're look, watching this. So strengths and opportunities are positive, Strengths and opportunities are positive. And on the other side, you have weaknesses and threats being negative. Okay, now we are going to look at national income and differences in economic development. We will start off by defining national income. And national income is usually defined as the total net value of goods, all goods and services produced in a nation over a specified period of time. So this represents the sum of wages, profits, rents, interest, and pension payments to residents of the nation. Okay, so your total outputs, your total expenditure, your total income, the total values of goods and services produced in a nation over a period of time, usually one year. Okay, so your national income, total value of goods and services produced over a period of time. We usually calculate it yearly. When we look at our measures of national income, the first measure of national income that we usually look at is your gross domestic product. So this is the final value or the value of 
final, let's put it that way, the value of final goods and services produced in an economy. So how much has been earned within a country's national boundaries over a period, usually a year. And here on your screens, I have put uh, the GDP for some selected countries. Uh, this should be the top uh, earning or the top valuable countries in the world as we speak. However, we can also look at the GDP growth rates and you find that most of the growth in GDP, so the change in GDP, so percentage change per year to growing per year. So let's say last year you made as a country a uh, hundred dollars uh, or a hundred uh, pounds, right? So the percentage change. So how much percentage have you grown by this year? You find that most of the change is coming from what would some would term developing countries, so not very wealthy countries initially, but these are high growth countries. And you see later, we'll talk about emerging economies. So you have developing countries, right? Um, some would say middle income countries, lower middle income countries, developing countries, and you find that they are growing a lot. Just look on this map and you will find uh, where these countries are and how they are growing. The next measure of national income we will consider is the gross national products. And this measures the value of final goods and services produced by nationals of that country. Here we have UK nationals, as opposed to the amount of money earned within that country, within the UK over a given period, usually a year. So gross national product made by nationals of the country. Okay, so the gross national product is uh, the measure of the final, uh, the, the measure measures the final value of goods and services earned by nationals of that country, as opposed to the amount of money earned within the country, usually a year. So you calculate it using this formula you have on your screens. So you'd have your GDP, which is what was made within the country. You minus income earned by overseas firms and households located within the economy. So foreign firms, foreign households within the economy. Then you add income earned by the country's households and firms that are working abroad. So some would say GDP plus net income from abroad. Okay, net income, of course, subtracting uh, earnings by overseas households and firms and adding your uh, earnings by your households and firms abroad. Um, so you also have your gross national income which is what's used by the World Bank currently, which is your gross national product plus subsidies received from abroad. So if you're receiving subsidies from abroad, maybe from any trade agreement, minus subsidies that you pay abroad. Okay, and there you get your gross national income, which is what the World Bank currently uses. You also have your net national product, which is uh, your gross national product minus depreciation. Why do you do this? Well, you find that um, some of the national income earned in a year is simply spent replacing the depreciation of assets rather than genuinely adding new output to the economy. For instance, if you're buying equipment to replace old machines that have stopped working, you are not increasing the productive capacity of the economy. Okay, so you're just replacing the wear and tear of the assets. So your net national product will then be your gross national product minus depreciation. You also have a measure here called your real GDP. So we know what our gross domestic product is, uh, your real GDP. Uh, you could versus that to your nominal GDP. So your real GDP is the economic output adjusted for the effects of inflation. So you adjust for inflation. Your nominal GDP is not adjusted for inflation. So economic output without the inflation adjusted. Um, so this is this is the main difference, the fact that uh, real values are adjusted for inflation and nominal values are not. And as a result of this, nominal GDP will often appear higher than real GDP. You also have the concept of PPP, 
purchasing power parity, which is a way to measure the purchasing power of the currencies by adjusting for the different price levels between countries. Okay, um, so price level differences between countries. So you want to divide the price of a basket of goods in one location by the price of uh, the same basket in another location. So you find that, okay, on paper, um, some countries would appear to be equal, but by the time you find out how much uh, the currency can actually buy within uh, the country, you then find a real value of, 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 of uh, goods and services. So you do that with purchasing power parity. Another way we can measure countries or national differences is by the standard of living. The standard of living. So the standard of living is the level of wealth, comfort, material goods, and necessities available to a certain socioeconomic class or a certain geographic area. It measures how well or how poorly a person or a group of people live in terms of having their needs and wants met. So for instance, you can have a high standard of living. So a person who can buy anything she or he wants, right? So that person has a high standard of living. They can have their needs, they can have their wants met. But of course, if a person does not have food or water, okay, they have a lower standard of living. How do we measure standard of living? Well, we usually measure it by dividing real GDP. Remember we said G real GDP is GDP adjusted for inflation divided by population. Why do we do this? You might have two countries with exactly the same amount of real GDP, but one country has more people than the other. So when you then see the GDP per capita, GDP per head, you then find that GDP, real GDP divided by population becomes important. For instance, you can have two countries, say country A and country B, they all have a real GDP or they both have a real GDP of 100 pounds. Let's just put that in for an example. But country A has 10 people, it's total population, and country B has 20 people. Of course, the real GDP per capita of country A will be 100 divided by 10. That will be 10, say, pounds or dollars per person. But country B will have 100 divided by 20, which is five pounds or five dollars per person. So you can see that actually country A per person is richer than country B. I have this example here on your screen. If the real GDP in the UK in 2024 is a 1.5 trillion uh, pounds and you have that uh, population there, uh, 65 million, then you find your real GDP per capita, which is your... Uh, 1.5 trillion divided by 65 million, and then you have real GDP per capita being uh, around 23,000 pounds, 23,077. Another way to measure standard of living is by using the Human Development Index, the HDI, which is a composite statistic, a composite index between zero and one of three indicators, life expectancy, education and per capita income so these three indicators have been brought together to get one composite index between zero and one and of course the closer you are to one the better the country is the higher the standard of living is the closer you are to zero the worse the country is the lower the standard of living so the hdi index uh, looks at long and healthy life. So what's the life expectancy? Okay, so that's the first uh, dimension there. The second one looks at knowledge, okay, like you're doing now, expected years of schooling, um, mean years of schooling. So education index, we get a, a, a feel of how educated people are in society. And then the final one is a measure of a decent standard of living. Okay, um, like we've seen before, we've said standard of living is measured by real GDP per capita most of the time, but the World Bank likes to use GNI per capita, and then you get the GNI index. And all of these together will give you another measure of a standard of living um, called the Human Development Index. The HDI was created to emphasize that people 
and their capabilities should be the ultimate criteria for assessing the development of a country and not economic growth alone you know and not gni per capita or gdp per capita alone but how well people are actually doing so it was created in 1990 by pakistani economist mahbub Uhak. um the hdi is a measurement system used by the united nations development program the undp to evaluate a country's human development human because that is what we are on your screen you have some countries and their hdi values as of 2022 so remember i said the closer to one you are the higher you are the closer to zero you are the lower you are so here are some hdi indicators Another way to look at society would be to look at something that all our measures that we have looked at, all our indicators, all our indices, all our techniques have not considered, which is the level of inequality in society. So when we look at GDP per capita, GDP per head, but you will see some people are doing better than others. Total GDP, total value of goods and services produced within a country, GNI. Um, gross national income, GNI per capita, and other forms, HDI, right? They have not let us know the difference in distribution. Some people might be doing very well and others not doing as well. So another way to look at this would be our Gini coefficient, a statistical measure of inequality in the distribution of income, wealth, or consumption within a country or social group. The Gini coefficient is measured on a scale of zero to one, zero representing perfect equality so everyone is perfectly equal and one representing perfect inequality so you have one person has everything and you know uh, everybody else basically does not have the closer the value is to one the greater the inequality um and there is a very fancy a very smart uh, formula to measure this economists will also measure this by using the area on the Lorenz curve diagram for this particular module I will not require you to to measure the Gini coefficient so you, you don't have to worry about it just to know what it means okay and yeah just looking at levels of, of inequality okay so that we can be kinder to each other it is important to note that there are factors other than income that affect the standard of living. Things like the quality of goods and services produced. So it just could be that high quality goods and services get produced in society and it helps society. People benefit from that. The quality of life, things like happiness, peace, fulfillment, you know, non-marketed items. Um, you know, it could be that we just simply do not sell or buy certain things. Um, the black economy so things that are done in the economy that are not declared so in some economies things like taking care of the elderly um, maybe the elderly would go to a care home children will go to a nursery but in certain economies that is done by the community by the family by the extended family by friends and relatives so that is not declared that is the black economy you have environmental issues that could affect the, the uh, standard of living Okay, so you could be living in a place, yeah, on paper it looks very good, uh, but maybe the air quality is not so good. In some big cities you see this. Cultural wealth, you know, you know, people could just be, have this uh, fantastic culture that you cannot measure, you know, and things like that. Um, you know, and, and there, are, there are things like that. On the quality of life, for instance, you know, things like kindness, people could be kind, or maybe it's your culture to be kind, right? So all uh, those sorts of things cannot be measured but they do affect the standard of living here we have forecasts of gdp for some select countries so this was done at the beginning of this century and is estimated that by the middle uh, of this century uh, there could be a change in the global economic environment in the global business environment so certain countries will be doing much better or should be doing much better in terms of GDP at least 
Um, this is not GDP per capita, but who knows? They could be doing better in that front as well, GDP per person. So if you see here, you see lots of countries in Asia to the right of your screen at 2050. Um, countries in Asia, um, countries in Africa, countries in Latin America, you know, should be doing better. I say to the right of my screen, it could be to the left, depending on where you're sat. Um, but yes, um, we might see some changes in G GDP um, value for certain countries and the makeup of the world in terms of economic dominance could change. A final way we can classify countries, a World Bank classification system, is by this measure you have on your screen. Um, here you have low income countries, lower middle income countries, upper middle income countries, and of course, high income countries based on GNI per capita. Okay, so low income countries by the World Bank classification system are countries with a GNI per capita of 1,025 US dollars or less. Lower middle income countries have between 1,026 US dollars to 4,035 US dollars. Upper middle income countries have a GNI per capita of 4,036 US dollars to 12,475 US dollars. And of course, high income countries have above 12,000 476 US dollars or from that amount and more. Um, right, so this is another way to classify countries and uh, you can see the, the mapping of where different countries are with regards to GNI per capita. So I'm going to round off now by defining an emerging economy. So these are societies that are transitioning from, say, a dictatorship or, you know, some sort of communist, uh, socialist, um, collectivist way of doing things to a free market orientated economy. They usually have increasing economic freedom, gradual integration with the global economy, an expanding middle class, so GNI per capita is rising, people are having more money to spend, improving standards of living, so people's standards of living like we've measured and talked about is rising, you have more social stability and tolerance, so more tolerance for other people, social stability, so less wars, less turbulence, as well as an increase in cooperation with multilateral institutions like the World Trade Organization. The World Bank, for instance. Some examples of emerging economies will be the BRICS economies, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, the N11 economies, you know, of um, uh, Nigeria, uh, Vietnam, Pakistan, Bangladesh, you know, Mexico, you name it. Some countries, they are doing better than others. Uh, but yeah, these are emerging economies. Um, you know, in the 80s, 90s, you also saw lots of ASEAN tigers, you know, Singapore, Malaysia, you know, the Philippines doing well as well. What are the key characteristics of emerging economies? A lot of them have undergone or are undergoing substantial political and economic reforms. So you have lots of reforms, um, political participation is being encouraged, the economy is being freed up. You have the removal of state intervention. So the government is privatizing assets and uh, institutions, restructuring of banking and finance to free up capital and investments. You also have this increasingly uh, welcome attitude towards international capital as well. Another key characteristic is the development and expansion of the middle class and like i said you know you're having more people coming into the middle class and having money to spend china is a very good example of this you know 500 million people have moved from poverty into the middle class um you know within the last 30 or so years and this is a fantastic story 
You also have low but growing income per capita. Okay, so income per capita might not be very high, but it is growing. You have high GDP growth rates. Uh, in fact, the GDP growth rate is usually higher than the GDP growth rate of many industrialized countries. Why do we study emerging economies? Well, because lots of multinationals are doing business in emerging economies to enjoy growing markets, to enjoy low cost of production, to increase their asset values. So a lot of them go to these countries because they have high growth rates. You want to be there to take advantage of this growing middle class that has money to spend. The cost of production is also lower. Land is cheaper, labor is cheaper. Asset values are rising, especially over time. You buy something cheap and then you can sell it uh, for very good profits. Um, emerging markets also tend to drive much of the expansion in the direction of global business. Okay, so lots of new products are coming out for these emerging markets and they are also introducing products to the market and they are involved in the value chain as well, in the production as well. Uh, lots of companies go abroad to learn from their practices, their strategies, you know, from established academic and manager concepts like we're having in this class. Okay, so they're growing in significance to the economics of the world. Like we said, you know, over the next couple of years, by 2050, a lot of them should have increased in GDP and they should become very relevant to the economics of the world. Okay, that is it for me from now. If you have any questions, feel free to hit me up, okay? Uh, book some office hours, send me an email, and have a very good day. Have a fantastic week. Be good to yourselves. Be good to your families. Take care of each other. Bye for now. See you later. Bye.